हरे कृष्णा शिक्षा शगम प्रभु वेलकम टू दॉन्स पॉडकास्ट इट इज बी लॉन्ग चेरिश डिजायर फॉर बी टू हैव यू हियर in fact you know the monks podcast is my way of continue to have the association of the many devotees who inspire me so i'm very grateful that somehow i could mm, you could say that persuade you or even compel you to join after <laughs> the way repeated uh, repeated reminders thank you for making time today well um, <clears throat> i should confess that you know i've been uh, watching all these podcast i don't think i might have missed even a single one and uh, you know especially performing my yoga in the morning uh, i i listen to your podcast and uh, i must say that uh, you know i have become such a big fan i'm already a big fan of yours but uh, after uh, watching hearing these podcast you know it's like on another level that uh, you have uh, brought out uh, the present krishna consciousness in our society and its relevance and how to understand how to explore it it's phenomenal the service which you are doing so i thought that you know uh, i can't be such a miserly person that i just keep you know taking from you and not uh, giving back anything in return so this is you know a small way i'm trying to you know Pay you back, you know, for what I'm receiving from you. Thank, Thank you. It's encouraging to hear that I'm yeah. having some service to you. Yes, the monks podcast. I feel that it's also two, three things. One is that it just gives an example of guhya makhyati pruchchati, which is yeah. often not seen in the public domain. Yeah. Another thing is that, as you said, we can discuss many aspects of Krishna consciousness which we don't get to discuss in our normal classes. Yeah. And yeah. also in that forum devotees uh, through the forum of discussion rather than a class lot of points come out which would not come out in the class class format so both in terms of the topic the exploration of the topic and the very mode of interaction between two 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 people two devotees i think it's it has its own distinctive appeal yeah in fact you know our scriptures it's nothing but discussion you know like if you if you look into bhagavad gita or shrimad bhagavatam it's it's more or less like you know one to one discussion going on and then you know uh, it, it was benefited it was like the original podcast you know bhagavad gita can be the original podcast <laughs> <laughs> good way of putting it yes true yeah. <laughs> hmm. and the upanishads are even more so in fact all our scriptures are like that broadly yeah 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 yes yes so bro uh, i thought we could discuss something about uh, say your particular service in terms of developing a vibrant spiritual community in which is i feel two dist- many things distinctly but one is that the it's already a sacred city nasik where you are developing it so mm-hmm. one aspect would be what are the challenges and opportunities in that and second is found that overall there is a very inclusive and welcoming mood where people can practice uh, practice bhakti at their pace so i will uh i remember during one of our meetings you mentioned to me that you felt that the community would be a success if devotees stop judging each other and treating each other harshly but everybody in the community feel, feels welcome and warm so that was i talked with leaders across the world not many devotee to temple leaders would mention that as their primary definition of what would be success of the community so that was very revealing about your personal focus and inspiring also about how how a community can develop so we i thought we'll talk about de- like developing a inclusive spiritual community in a sacred city and we can yes, talk yes. about that thing yes yes okay? perfect. perfect perfect thank you so yeah. maybe we can start a little bit with you know how you were introduced to krishna consciousness and how you eventually came to be the leader of uh, nasik project could tell something about you know well, i'm not a leader over here i'm just uh, a representative uh, you know uh, of radha gopina temple sent over here so i'm just trying to share whatever i have been blessed with uh, you know in my growing up in krishna consciousness uh, under you know the the wonderful tutelage of especially radhanath swami 
and and of course you know all all senior vaishnavas god brothers over there um as far as uh, my coming to krishna consciousness well uh, my my brother swarup damodar prabhu he was uh, you know already introduced to radha gopinath temple this is way back in uh, 92 93 so that time he was uh, he was studying in bombay and he got introduced first bhakti rasamrit maharaj and uh, then he introduced all of us myself my mother my sister you know uh, to radha gopinath temple mm-hmm. uh, so was my... it the time when you were in the air force or it was before or after that yeah. this was this was when i was in the air force yeah so i was i was uh, in mumbai I was, no i was posted in delhi okay and uh, so i used to visit uh, uh bombay uh and and of course kopoli where i grew up so that time because uh, swarup damodar prabhu was living in bombay so you know we would uh, in fact uh, uh this is something which might uh, sound silly but uh, whenever uh, this is you know before uh, we both uh, came to krishna consciousness whenever i would come to bombay uh so we would have like uh, our own you know party both of us together you know eating in bombay watching movies going around because uh, we would meet uh, like once in six months or seven eight months like that whenever i would get leave and i would come home so so first we would hang around and then we would go to kopoli and then spend time but then when he uh, got in touch with radha gopinath temple so he like spiritualize that party you know <laughs> he oh. took me to the temple and we had nice prasad went to the temple and you know, all of that so so that was uh, uh, that was like the basic introduction which so were you already from your upbringing was uh, uh, was somewhat religiously or spiritually inclined uh yes uh, because born in in a in a pious brahmin hindu family uh marwadi uh in fact my both grandfathers uh, they the only thing they did was my my nana ji was a uh, bhagavat kathakar in fact and and uh, he left his body in a very spiritual way he 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 was he would you know just like we talk of varnashram wherein the brahmanas would uh, impart spiritual knowledge to the vaishya so so in his village in rajasthan so that's what he would do all these big uh, marwadi businessmen like poddars ruiyas birlas and they, so they would uh, have him over every day to speak bhagwat and oh. he would he would uh, you know speak bhagwat to them and uh, so that was and, his like uh, that was that his main active main profession uh, kind of yeah, or, or? Yeah, that's it that's it and and you know they would just take care of uh, you know is uh, day to day expenses like groceries and everything oh amazing like it was a very you know uh, what i was told it was still that uh, pure varnashram style of living oh okay and this was uh, so you knew your grandfather grandfather or great grandfather you're saying so you knew him also grandfather, personally grandfather great grandfather not great grandfather grandfather so you knew him also Oh well I um I'm I knew my um uh, uh father's father but my mother's my maternal grandfather somehow I I couldn't meet him he he left quite early when oh, he was okay. in his days Oh okay in fact he 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 knew that he's about to leave his body and you know he was on his way to one of the homes to recite the bhagwat he asked the rickshaw wala to stop he got down from the rickshaw and started chanting bhagavad gita and bhagavad shlokas and uh, that's how he left his body oh really on the road while yeah. chanting yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's remarkable so yeah. it's almost like propa said i would like to die on a battlefield while preaching about krishna so it's like that he was he was going out for sharing krishna katha and that's when he left yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. <clears throat> so there was because of that a legacy of discussing uh, krishna katha in your family there after also 
yes and and my mother uh, specifically she was very very much uh, spiritually inclined she always wanted a guru in her life and uh, you know uh, of course now moving you know, my father moved to bombay and you know lifestyle changes and you know uh, your priorities change but still the basic spiritual culture my mom uh, she was the one who uh, always inculcated in us uh, and uh, in fact uh, uh, she used to attend all these bhagavat saptahs whenever it would happen because my father was working in birla's company so uh, uh, birla's you know mostly they were marwadis who were employees and they would always keep bhagavat saptahs like that you know on a regular basis so my mother was always very inclined to anyone who would come to give any katha she would be there to attend and she would take me along also take us along you know myself and you know my other siblings mm. and also uh, i remember uh, i used to attend these uh, chinmaya mission classes you know bal vihar classes in my childhood in fact chinmayanand swami himself would personally come and uh, he would uh, you know speak to us he was very good at uh, telling stories so he would spend time with us uh, chinmayan and swami uh, so on a regular basis that was also one thing you know uh, reciting bhagavad gita shlokas and mahabharata stories like that you know since childhood so we were quite you know in touch with you know uh, something or the other hmm that's interesting so it is almost multiple sources within the family with from other spiritual teachers and the overall culture also in so, fact my mother every day she would read uh, just the text of bhagavad gita from uh, she had this uh, from gita press and later on we found out that it was actually the translation of balde vidya bhushan which uh, you know the copy she had she didn't even know she just got it from gita press and every day she would read the bhagavad gita in fact you know i remember once when i was visiting my mother in vrindavan she was listening to one of my lectures and then she said that so do you think that uh, you are giving all these geetha lectures so all credit goes to you for this i said definitely not and she said that when you were in my womb so i used to recite you know bhagavad geetha bhagavatam ramayana and all of that on a regular basis so you should you know and she she was you know in a very sweet way she said that you know you should definitely uh uh, uh share the credit with me also <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's like dhruva maharaj and his mother eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah really so how is baldev vidyabhushan's gita that's not that common isn't it that way that's remarkable yeah so later on uh, when uh, you know we came uh to krishna consciousness that that uh, bhagavad gita copy was still there somewhere at home and then uh, i think one of us happened to see the name baldev vidyabhushan written on it hmm and uh, that's uh, it's right? only one baldev vidyabhushan <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> as far as i know but then, so then what was it if you already had that background was there something specific that attracted you to krishna consciousness well uh, you know when when i was growing up you know this mahabharat serial of b r chopra okay so that kal who yeah 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 so that was like you know the audio visual effect which all of us had and especially you know the 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 the, the personality of krishna the one who uh, enacted the role of krishna you know the way he uh, was uh, depicting krishna was uh, something which was very attractive to all of us yeah well you can say it was um, a bit superficial just you know a, a tv serial but uh, the whole mood of uh, um, you know catching the the attractive feature of krishna as you know through that mahabharat serial that caught us and then you know i think it was just you know uh paving way uh to come to the real essence you know of krishna consciousness so that was like in fact my mother also 
uh, she she had approached someone you know some guru and and she was given the mantra om namah shivaya to chant but somehow she was so inclined and attracted to krishna so she on her own she changed it to om namah bhagavate vasudevaya and she used to chant om namah bhagavate vasudevaya <laughs> so yeah there was there was some you know this uh, inclination you know for krishna uh, especially you know the the mahabharat krishna like that so so you are saying that that was the foundation which attracted you which made you more attracted to krishna consciousness as pre- krishna as presented in the, in the krishna conscious movement or how 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 did that ready you in a sense yeah so that was like uh, you know like the beginning of uh, being attracted to the personality of krishna that you know a, a person who is who seems to be so perfect a person who seems to be flawless you know like that and 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 who who is you know like a multifaceted personality he is intelligent he is he is clever he is naughty you know everything like that so so all of uh, these facets of krishna was especially you know for myself i can say that you know I, whenever i would watch uh, that character of krishna uh, so this was the picture you know that you know you cannot you cannot find uh, any loophole in him you know this person like that mm. so so that was just the beginning and uh, i remember one incident uh, in in my balvihar classes there was a drawing competition so so this was you know when i was i think 7th uh, 7th or 8th standard so there was this one picture of krishna which i drew and this was from our bbt paintings it's like just krishna uh, you you must have seen this picture of krishna very famous he's he's not playing his flute he's holding the flute so he's he's looking as if he's looking at the camera and he's mm-hmm. holding the flute just like teenage uh, krishna very beautiful picture so so i took that of course i didn't know that it's from his con it's from bbt so i i took that as you know in the drawing competition to paint and somehow i i i won that uh oh okay maybe because there were <laughs> no other good painters i am not a painter but you know whatever little i could do so i i that was something you know that particular picture of krishna it it, it stuck in my mind that you know, yeah it got me the first prize also and you know, i was very much attracted to that particular picture of krishna so this was when i was in 7th 8th standard you know for the bal vihar drawing competition and then you know fast forward i've joined the air force and you know i am uh, posted and this is uh, in the 90s now 91 around 91 92 and uh, um, where we were staying like the boys hostel for the for the air force officers hostel mm. once i saw uh, as i was going uh, towards the officers mess i saw in a dustbin the same picture you know on a greeting card and it was some some somebody might have thrown in dustbin that picture it was exactly the same picture which i had you know i drew uh, back then in my childhood so uh, i didn't have the heart to just leave it in the dustbin you know so I, i i i went back to the dustbin i picked it up i i went to my locker i put it in my locker and i said okay so somehow you know the old memories of this picture has come about and the lord has somehow you know krishna has come back uh, in, in a in a maybe slightly mystical way so i said i should offer him something so i started to offer him incense you know? and i remember exactly one week after that i was introduced to radha gopina temple and then you know uh, somehow remote connection of that Hmm. this was a uh, which year 90 93 i was introduced oh uh, and uh, this happened yeah around at the same time you know this this incident happened around the same time that's amazing 
So, so it seems you also were quite. Uh, not only did you have a lot of spiritual and culture, spiritual cultural impressions, you also had uh, quite a set of hobbies. Did it? Is your your painter? I believe you also were. No, no, no. I was. I was. <laughs> no, I mean, it must have been some good if you won a competition. But apart from uh-huh. that, I believe you also were a sports player, isn't it? Uh, t- t- you were lawn, yeah. table, t- lawn ten- table tennis player, isn't it? Yeah, initially began with table tennis, and, and then, you went to uh, quite a high level in that, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. As far as uh, table tennis, I I played uh, district level. Uh, we I had won district level, and then from there on, uh, uh, switched to lawn tennis, and then when I was in the Air Force, then uh, you know i was selected in the air force team and then later on uh, in the services team which is like they play the nationals so services team they play on a national level so so there on uh, uh, i took the professional route for lawn tennis oh so you you did both in one sense both uh, table tennis and lawn tennis both yeah initially it began with table tennis but then you know my coach said that you can't uh, you can't play both you have to stick to one you know either table tennis or lawn tennis so oh, okay. i had to choose so i chose lawn tennis <laughs> it seems uh, some people are blessed with uh, you could say a problem of plenty so you had lots of talents <laughs> uh, so this is uh, so you already had that uh, appreciation for krishna and then the beautiful picture of krishna so when you came to the temple so did was it through some sunday program or was it some special yeah. course or what was it sunday program i still remember maharaj radhanath maharaj's sunday feast class and still remember the title of that class fire of harina and maharaj was speaking about uh, draupadi Uh, interesting you know that point it's so it's like you know the first lecture of radhanath maharaj and you know the kind of examples and i was so intrigued that you know this person doesn't look indian and you know how does he know so much how does he know so much about uh, you know these stories from our scriptures so he was he was uh, giving the example of how the fire of harinam just like you know the flames they are like uh, you know the the arms of the fire going up similarly when draupadi was calling out for krishna both her arms were going up and you know so she, he connected you know so the title of that lecture fire of harinam he was connected harin he was connecting harinam with you know the the fire of harinam sankirtan and draupadi's arms going up just like the flames of fire yeah another incident uh, which i remember when Mm, that time there were no email so so sarup down the who used to write letters and uh, so he when he wrote to me that you know uh, i should uh, find out some iskon temple there in delhi and try to go visit see you know how it's like because he he had started going uh, in bombay so uh, i i looked for and uh, i i remember that time the delhi temple was a small one it was uh, not the big temple this was in uh, 90 same 93 yeah so the small temple radha parsarthi and uh, as soon as i walked in i saw this american brahmachari and he was distributing bhagavad gita and uh, and you know he was he just caught my eye that again you know so i had the background of you know being in the armed forces and how you look at foreigners you know being being uh, <laughs> that's uh, interesting okay so i was like a foreigner you know uh, a white bodied american and holding bhagavad gita and wearing saffron robes and all of that so i immediately approached him and i was just for 5 minutes i was just looking at him you know the way he was speaking and that is he is it for real uh, or is it fake what is it <laughs> so um, uh, he <clears throat> i asked him that you know what brought about this change in you and he just you know showed me the bhagavad gita this book brought about the change in me now again 
the Bhagavad Gita, the Bal Vihar classes, all the Bhagavad Gita shlokas, which we used to recite, you know, all of that, you know, started to surface up. And, and my mother reciting every day Bhagavad Gita. So he was speaking of, from the Bhagavad Gita. And then one statement which he made that, you know, like kind of hit my ego. <laughs> so he said, um, Bhagavad Gita, it's your book. You must be knowing this. It's it's from your country. You must be knowing. I don't know what inspired him to say that, you know. <laughs> that you know, he was talking about country and, you know. But like, I, I didn't go in my uniform. I was I was just as a civilian but he spoke about the country this is books from your country you should be knowing this right and i felt like so ashamed (laughs) that uh, you know here is a foreigner an american and he's here reminding me and that time you know like kind of silently within myself i decided that no matter what happens you know i should study this book and you know if if possible, you know, I would like to also, you know, preach about this book. So that was, you know, that, that I don't know who was that Brahmachari, but that one Brahmachari, he kind of created an impact. Oh, so you never met him afterward. You didn't come to know who he was also. And That's remarkable. Yeah. Okay. Must have been Eklavya Prabhu. I don't know because Eklavya Prabhu was the lot you know, in Delhi that time. Oh, okay. Must have been, I don't know, because... True. This is amazing. So then, uh, so this is uh, how you were introduced, and then you decided to... Uh, what inspired you specifically to join? It is just the desire to, like you said, you wanted to study and teach the Gita? Was that the motivation, primarily? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And and also because, you know, the kind of uh, competition which I was seeing, you know, those who were, uh, like I was I was selected uh, uh, as a fighter pilot. So those who were below me, they wanted to become like me. Those who were like me, they wanted to go above me. So I, 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 I saw that kind of, uh, you know, that race, that race, you would call it. Uh, and it was going endless. So... So that was like something not so significant, but yes, it was there. That is there something more to, you know, uh, life. Oh, okay. So, and then you know everything they they just uh, fell into place. Uh, these kind of uh, uh, questions, and then uh, you know associations, especially when I saw Bhakti Samrat Maharaj. You know, I, I was. I was so impressed that here is, you know, a person who is so young, who is so educated, who is so talented, who could have done anything he wanted, but he chose this and, you know, everything, whatever he presents is. So what attracted me to Krishna consciousness was, uh, was the, the logic Oh, okay. More than, more than, you know, the big temples or, you know, uh, or, or even the prasad. <laughs> what what attracted me was the way logically it was presented. Mm-hmm. Especially when I would discuss with Bhakti Samarath Maharaj and he would, that he could sense that, you know, this person uh, more than, uh, uh, more than speaking, deep philosophy or any other kind of, you know, uh, rituals of Krishna consciousness, he kind of uh, is inclined towards understanding the logic. Why? Why do we do whatever we do? You know, that kind of, those kind of things. Hmm. Yeah, he, it seems Bhakti Samad Mahaj has inspired a, practically an entire generation of uh, Devotees, Radhisham Prabhu, Gaurang Prabhu, you, and quite a, it's a, a remarkable. Yeah, I also remember that when I heard his classes, the the logic was so simple, yet so so convincing. So that was striking. So, I, you know, when I think I met you first, 
you may not remember it it is you were well known and celebrated as a personal servant of his own sadhat maharaj and in that role we met and talked a few times then for you i believe it was a uh, uh, it was a radical change in your service when you were sent to uh, nasik of course you are doing some preach you are doing a good amount of preaching in mumbai but were you already building some kind of community in mumbai with some congregation programs or yeah, how yeah, did yeah. that how did that happen that you were sent to uh, how did that service change happen for you coming to nasik yeah i mean both ways you know the idea of being a community developer or a congr- that was was that something which you are already having some experience while you were in mumbai well uh, yeah i was doing both uh, you know uh, our uh, congregational preaching as well as uh, college preaching okay and so so because uh, i i was doing this borivili program which was in hindi okay so that time uh, not many of our preachers were uh, preaching in hindi in bombay and uh, so because i had the background of uh, you know uh, speaking hindi as well so therefore i was given uh, you know some of the programs which were in hindi over there and then <clears throat> Govind Prabhu, in fact, uh, he called me uh, at that time. You know, I was fully packed with like you know five days in a week. My programs were on English, Hindi, congregation program, college program, then you know meetings, counselling meetings, and all of that. Everything was going on. So he uh, he asked me that, uh, do you mind uh, you know visiting Nasik once in a while? so it started off like that you know uh, mm. <laughs> and i didn't even know which direction nasik is like i was so much into mumbai <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah, this was which year roughly this was uh, when govind prabhu approached me this was in 2006 okay yeah so, so almost more than a decade you were there in the ashram before ramas prabhu used to come okay and Ramas Prabhu's locker was, you know, in the same line. It was a few lockers uh, uh, from my locker, and uh, I used to see Ramas Prabhu, you know, uh, three days in a week, and he would go to Nasik and come back, and I would wonder, you know, where this person goes, you know, three days is is not to be seen. <laughs> and then, you know, I, I always thought that, you know, Nasik is like you know, a forlorn place, you know. I'm not meant for, you know, any place outside of Mumbai. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but then when going through asked me so i asked why me so he said they they need someone you know who can preach in english who can preach in uh, hindi and who can also manage more than anything else who can also manage so that's how then uh, i couldn't say no to go in through so i said okay i i i'll try so initially it was just uh, saturday sunday uh, uh weekend over there but then i i loved the weather here in nasik and one thing which uh, attracted me was you know the the challenge you know having been trained uh, in the armed forces you know we were always taught that you know newer and newer challenges they make you grow so i i saw this difference that radha gopinath temple everything was like set for you Mm. when it comes even finances or you know all the other departments everything you don't have to worry you just have to go preach that's it the only thing which you have to worry is whether your notes are you know <laughs> properly <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> you know for your lecture that's it but here in nasik everything you know the finances you know no brahmacharis at that point of time so you know to have start a brahmachari ashram and to take care of uh, you know the grahasthas their problems and uh, you know whatever little bits the temple structure you know how to how to manage that you know so mm-hmm. so i i i really like that challenge that you know it will help me grow oh okay that's amazing so then from 2006 or then since then you have been almost 15 years consistently been in nasik isn't it 
so 2006 i was shuttling um okay in mumbai like that and 2008 then i moved i decided that you know i can't do this you know bombay and nasik both because nasik started to grow and uh, it required me to be here more <laughs> in fact i'll tell you one funny thing this was in 2003 just kumbh mela and uh, that time i was uh, serving radhanath maharaj and uh, this was the first time when i came to nasik along with radhanath maharaj as a servant okay. mm. so so we were booked on this tapovan express and uh, and and i was carrying all the luggage of maharaj and it was the ac coach and i didn't know that this train the nasik is not the last stop so tapovan express goes further till nanded hmm so i didn't know that nasik is not the last stop i thought nasik is the last stop and you know radha maharaj you know he whenever he gets down from you know a, a train like that you know he allows all the passengers to first get down and then slowly you know he'll move out and the train uh, would stop only for 5 minutes okay and ac coach and everyone they whatever little congregation over here and they were all ready to welcome maharaj with kirtan and all on the on the platform and uh, by the time maharaj got down the train started and i was left inside the coach along with all his luggage you know like at least three big bags like that and everyone as soon as maharaj got down everyone just you know started to you know follow behind maharaj and no one <laughs> no one even thought of that you know where is his luggage or you know is there someone else along with him and you know the train it it took momentum it started and the first thing i did that you know the uh, i did realize that you know this this train uh, where it's going then i asked you know where is where is this train you know, what's the last stop and they said that you know nanded is the last stop so i threw the bags first on the platform and then people realized that uh, and then i was fearing that you know somebody shouldn't come and just pick up and you know steal away maharaj's bags and by the time it was for me to now jump off the train the train had left the platform and everyone was shouting that you know hey maharaj kya kar raha hai mar jayega mat kudna mat kudna like that <laughs> oh god <laughs> but somehow you know my, my training <laughs> it helped me it came handy so i jumped on my force fortunately on the other track there was no train coming and you know i was on my force and as i was getting up this was like you know the first entry into nasik <laughs> <laughs> it seems adventure follows you wherever you go huh? <laughs> yeah. and as as i was getting up you know on, on that railway track i just you know spoke to myself never ever i'm going to come to this place again <laughs> and you know maybe krishna heard that you know and he said he must have you know smiled and said let's see <laughs> <laughs> oh god that's remarkable so this was uh, among your first trips even before you started coming in nasik weekly it was before that also yeah. it was 2006 so this was 2003 kumbh mela oh okay that's much i was accompanying maharaj as a servant you know to kumbh mela so uh, when when you started coming to nasik uh, see i was i as you know i my parents used to stay in nasik and i was you could say <clears throat> introduced uh, in pune by gorsundar prabhu and then also i met shri brahmam prabhu in nasik at that time we just mm-hmm. had a small flat yeah where he was just visiting and occasionally doing some uh, weekly doing some programs Yeah. from there now we have a beautiful temple yeah. with uh, a significant number of people coming both on sundays as well as on wednesday evenings of course the covid pandemic is different but still so it's been a significant growth i believe 
you have several th- uh, more than nearly a uh, several hundred people come for the gita amrut and the sunday classes isn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's almost about your temple hall capacity is 300 but quite often on most festivals it's yeah, we much have more with, than that you have know, the screen outside in outside then screen you know up on the terrace so people are all over oh so it's been quite a significant growth now i haven't seen especially for a week day to have a program where several hundred people come that's remarkable so okay, maybe you can tell something about your journey from there so when you came to nasik uh, what were your thoughts when you were told to start coming there so when did you actually start uh, basing yourself 2008 was it or or in a year or two yeah. so from 2006 to 2007 8 i was uh, i was quite regular and uh, so i i i just thought that you know i have to first get everyone together you know through uh uh introducing the culture of hearing and chanting together so i was doing bhagavat saptah i did bhagavat saptah also over here and then every festival like ram navmi or krishna janmashtami one week katha like that so a lot of kathas uh, i began with and and that's how um, trying to get everyone together okay so that uh, you know i knew that once everyone comes together then you know uh, i can i can uh, i can get a support of of uh, of some sincere devotees who can help me out to spread okay so that was just in my mind you know uh, to just uh, to just get to know everyone you know uh, who is there in the congregation and uh, the other pious families you know these bhagavat kathas were also to attract many uh, pious hindu families here in nasik so that you know i get to know uh, that how much are they inclined and you know how much are they willing to commit to uh, to support propas mission Mm-hmm. like that That's so initially it started with you know uh, just because there were no dts then so we only had small gornita there were no dts so this was another thing in my mind to somehow uh, get enough brahmacharis and congregation devotees so that we can get permission to have our own installed dts oh because many of the families they would they would not understand you know who are these two personalities you know gornita they would just because you know uh to explain to them that they are the incarnations in kaliyuga same krishna and balram so uh, many of the hindu family they relate to ram or krishna you know that you either you should have ram darbar or radha krishna like that they are used to iskon means radha krishna radha krishna like that so yes i i um, that was there in my mind to somehow have uh, our own dts which will also not just attract new people but also the existing congregation they will they will have like you know a, a central figure a reason for them to come again and again to the temple that's true yeah. I, in one sense now prabhu if we see prabhupad's uh, outreach also he did give a, a very central focus to uh, to having a temple in his outreach in india in the west it was more of uh, they have some structure where you can have kirtans and other things get for people to come together and have kirtans and hear some talks but prabhupad did give a significant thrust on temples so it does seem that temp- a proper temple with a uh, with dts you need yeah. them for being able to do a significant outreach isn't it yeah especially you know a holy place like this where people already they are inclined towards you know uh doing certain rituals uh in a in a certain way and uh, you know offering themselves at different levels you know uh to the deities so holy place always you know 
holy place means temples this means you know the the deity is within those temples so mm. obviously you know they would be asking this question that okay what's your speciality because very few uh, you will find that uh, will be attracted directly to the philosophy and, and hearing and chanting so initially they come to the temple okay so they have beautiful deities let's go let's have darshan and and then uh, once uh, they see that you know along with the darshan you know there is also darshan shastra <laughs> hmm and, and that's the yeah. that's how the, the entire package uh, uh, it, it works like that so how much did nasik already being a holy place affect the way you say shared bhakti in one sense we could say that the we have places are primarily defined as holy places like sevandavan or mayapur you jagannath puri their whole defining identity is as a holy place and even we could say to some extent tirupati pandharpur where also we have temples and nasik is known as a holy place but i don't think that is in in the in the indian imagination in general popular conception that is not like the sole defining identity of nasik nasik is also seen as a growing hub of development and other things so how much did the fact that nasik is a holy place of lord ram how much did that uh, shape the way you did uh, your uh, the development of the community there conducted the programs and things like that well i can just say that personally of course you know it's it's uh, lord ram's place and personally of course i i can say that influenced me but uh, um as far as for spreading the movement over here not so much because nasik uh, is so well connected with mumbai and like you said uh, it's a growing city in fact you know i was shocked to see many of the holdings where uh, i read nasik you know nasik the wine city <laughs> because of the grapes and the wineries over here so many oh, okay. nasik, nasik uh, became famous as the wine city uh, in fact my own uncle uh, he was in one of the wineries over here and he was like you know the person who would uh, who would give seminars on uh, you know the different kinds of wines and the wine tasting team he was on and once he came for one of my seminars and i i was uh, surprised to see him my father's elder brother you know i've seen him after like decades and he was there he he got to know that you know i i'm in nasik now so he he came and then um, he was talking about that how he also gives talks on you know <laughs> on wine <laughs> that's interesting yeah i never knew yeah i know grapes are big there but i de- obviously it's a straightforward connection from there but i never thought of it that way so then there was some you know senior congregation devotees who were there you know so they were overhearing as he was talking to me so i i was so they were wondering that who is this person you know uh, so i said to them that you know so he speaks about wine as i speak about divine <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one thing which i noticed that you you have a very attractive way to play with words you know, spontaneously i am <laughs> not close to you <laughs> you are you are the master of that <laughs> i don't know see mine is more of uh, sharing philosophical wisdom through carefully thought out play of words but it's not so much spontaneously bringing out things like that i'm not sure that happens with me so much mm-hmm. but that's wonderful so yeah, so not uh, so much it's not uh, uh, it's not so much seen now as uh, as a holy place only few still the the old nasik you know still it has and whenever kumbh mela happens otherwise uh, or or people go to trambakeshwar trambakeshwar is in fact 35 kilometers uh, outskirts of nasik it's not like you cannot call it technically nasik so otherwise no it's it's like any other city okay so overall so when you said that you initially came so so there were no specific uh, challenges or even opportunities that came just because it's a holy dham 
So, of course, I feel that as compared to Mumbai, Nasik's atmosphere must have been significantly different in the kind of people who came or not much. Yeah, it was um, it was different in the sense uh, that Bombay, you know, uh, Radha Gopinath Temple, the crowd is more like South Bombay crowd and uh, more modern kind of people. So uh, also language was one, another thing that, you know, over here, I, I was not speaking in Marathi. I understand Marathi, but I can't speak in Marathi. So uh, now my Hindi also was uh, not like, you know, the the Maharashtrian Bombay kind of Hindi. So my Hindi was more like the North Indian Hindi. And that also I had to curtail a little bit so that people could, you know, relate to and understand. And especially when, you know, you, you use spiritual terms. You know, uh, that's true. Like I remember, you know, <laughs> this is a funny incident. Uh, oh, oh, one uh, congregation devotee, after you know, he had invited me over for lunch, and uh, he asked me, "Prabhuji, wo aap uh, aapke lecture mein bolte hain na? Aapke koi dost hain kya? Wo Air Force ke hain ki uh, aapke wo is kaun ke? Wala kaun dost?" हालांकि हालांकि आप बोलते ना उनका नाम बोलते रहते हैं गॉड दैट्स सच ऑर्डिनरी वर्ड इन वन सेंस या सो सो सच एन ऑर्डिनरी वर्ड सो देन आई रियलाइज दैट यू नो आई हैव टू आल्सो यू नो टेलर माय लैंग्वेज यू नो ओवर हियर सो लैंग्वेज ऑफ ऑफ कोर्स इट्स इट्स अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टूल व्हेन इट कम्स टू कन्वेइंग द मैसेज and making people you know uh, mm. like uh, relate to the philosophy and what they can practice once they go back home like that true yes mm. so so you men- so you mentioned that you had this various katha programs but overall as you started developing the community in one sense getting more people to join uh, and participate so in general what are the broad challenges like i have been spending a good amount of time the last few years in western outreach so i know what are the typical challenges we as a movement face uh, in attracting western people in one sense as compared to the rest of the world we are quite successful in india as compared to the rest of the world but still it's that we are attracting a significant number of people at the same time people also have many preconceptions about us which sometimes obstruct them from coming close to mm. us so in general in say attracting audience to practice uh, to come to krishna consciousness in say in nasik in particular in general in mumbai or in india what are the typical challenges which you feel we need to address or which which did you focus on addressing yeah uh, um one thing is that uh, when people will come for our programs hmm so initially you know the the entire package of our program like you know kirtan then we have you know lecture then we have prashadam or dancing kirtan and the whole ambience of the temple you know that's something which initially you know families when they come they they really they they see this is a happening place this is a happening temple this is not just you know a place you come and you know have darshan and just you know uh, it's like any other temple you visit ring the bell have darshan have some prayer and leave but then you know uh, they they want to come back to get that experience especially kirtan and prasad you know initially lecture is not so much but then when they see that oh there is something you know serious going on which means you know these people they are not just into uh, uh, giving us a one day experience but something which you know they they are also practicing on a day to day basis 
so uh, a system wherein you can uh, have them relate to their level that's the first challenge mm-hmm. what like, uh, their level exactly like you know i i remember one of my talks and i was mentioning the five levels of sadhaka it okay. begins with it begins with durachar so <laughs> okay <laughs> the lowest level the lowest level is durachar so once uh, one realizes you know about the durachar then comes the lachar <laughs> that's beautiful okay lachar <laughs> and then and then after uh, lachar comes vichar then you start okay. think about okay that where did i go wrong what am i doing wrong you know that's vichar and and the fourth is called sadachar okay so from from the lowest durachar you come to the fourth which is sadachar and then the final fifth is prachar so durachar lachar vichar sadachar and prachar <laughs> i was thinking whether i could get some rhyming words in english for this but i don't think i can get it on the words without of you know you can say valueless helpless but then you move to thoughtful you, then careful cultureful vigorful something like that but that's nice so five levels okay yeah just like you know we 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 speak about uh, these uh, i think those six levels that uh, what is krishna you know uh, the the six concentric circles and how when someone comes to krishna consciousness the the outermost circle is what is krishna you know comes with that question okay what is krishna uh, what are these hari krishnas up to you know what is krishna like that hmm. so so that question and then from there when they when they attend a program when they uh, have darshan of the deities or have prasadam hear about krishna so the next is okay uh i like krishna so mm-hmm. from from what is krishna i like krishna then from liking krishna okay uh i i i choose krishna you know which means you know i start i start to develop love for krishna and then the next is i follow krishna which is difficult one yeah so what is krishna i like krishna then you know i i love krishna i trust krishna i follow krishna and then you know finally uh uh krishna becomes my life hmm. and krishna becomes my mission that's beautiful so so, so when uh uh when you see people they they you know crossing these levels so hmm. sometimes some people might take a long time just liking krishna some people might take uh, even more longer time trusting krishna okay i may like krishna but do i trust krishna the trusting means like you know changing you know uh, not just rearranging the furniture at home making an altar but also changing your lifestyle your you know your your entire family setup you know that's like people really when they start trusting krishna that okay you know i'm going to change uh the way we live i'm going to change you know even my career options or you know the parenting how how you know the parenting is to be done for the kids or you know even you know what kind of shopping we do where do we go on holidays and these are all you know family decisions day to day family decisions which people they change or they make it krishna conscious because they start trusting krishna so on mm. trusting krishna so you know so, so taking them through all these levels and you know giving them so uh, broadly speaking three things which uh, i was making sure that uh, they should get one is spiritual instructions hmm the second is they should uh, they should see examples of not just examples from the pages of bhagavatam or mahabharat or ramayana but living examples which means they can see okay someone 
uh, from my own, you know, residential complex or someone who is also in my same company where I'm working is also following this. So I, living examples. One is spiritual instruction, second is living example, and third is spiritual experience. Hmm. So three things, you know, uh, these are simple things which, you know, any family or few families, when they start getting these things, then, you know, they start to grow. Then they start to show interest that, okay, you know, I'm getting some spiritual experience. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing people who are following in their lives. And I'm also uh, getting a spiritual experience of following that. Whatever that experience could be something uh, very small for them. Like, okay, you know, uh, every day uh, offering food to the Lord. You know? so, so initially mm. they get they get an experience, oh, you know, when they, when they initially I've seen families, you know, when they report to me that, oh, we have started offering food, you know, we have an altar, small altar, we have started offering food. And then they would come and say that, you know, when we taste that, you know, of course, it's not that they can, you know, remarkably mark the difference that, okay, the taste has changed or something like that. But, you know, the, the whole feeling that, okay, now we are doing something and uh, uh, we are, we are, uh, we are doing something on our own, not just uh, coming to the temple and eating prasad, but we're doing something on our own for the Lord. Mm -hmm. so, so that kind of ownership which they get to do something personally uh, for Krishna is, uh, you know, uh, is, is worth celebrating. Beautiful. Sometimes you put it in that you go to a temple, then you make your home into a temple, and then you make your heart into a temple. So it's like yeah. you're making your home into a temple is that they're developing, they're personalizing their devotion. Yeah. So you said you focused on presenting them three things. One is instruction. So was the instruction itself a part of personalizing or personalizing is somewhat different? Yeah, personalizing. Yeah, instruction comes in that also because <clears throat> I have seen that... Uh, <clears throat> When you are taking care of a congregation, especially in India, <clears throat> a place like Nasik, wherein, you know, uh, the family structures are more, you know, uh, cultured and, and they have that kind of respect for sadhus and, uh, you know, that, uh, mm. that saintly come to their house. So uh, I have seen that more than just giving big talks, uh, they also look forward for uh, like a personalized uh, sessions with them. And personalized sessions, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, having very philosophical discussions. Just, you know, like going to their house, recognizing, you know, their family, whatever, you know, little bit they are doing, you know, they, they feel that, okay, that... Uh, uh, we also can do something, making them feel that you have the potential to to please Krishna. Oh, okay. You can, you can do that from the Vyasasana, but more effective is of the Vyasasana. Mm. Like that. That's true. So overall, what you're saying is that uh, a temple needs to be a a multi, you could say a multi-dimensional resource for enabling people to personally connect with Krishna. Yeah. So it could be in terms of uh, getting the knowledge, so it also get, getting so seeing some examples, and uh, so now sometimes. We see bhakti being presented as a one zero thing. That is, somebody is practicing, then okay, you're chanting this many rounds, now you increase your rounds, and now you come to the level of initiation. And if people don't come to that, then they feel a little pressured too much or neglected and devalued. So, in one sense, it's natural that we want everyone to grow. But at the same time, that uh, 
I believe that you don't, you try to avoid that having that one zero that people should not feel pressured to. So how do yeah. we inspire people to grow without pressuring them? Well, I'll tell you one incident. You know, when I was uh, uh, preaching in Mumbai, so this one congregation program I was doing. This was in English in in Chennai. Mm-hmm. I was doing this congregation program, and this HPCL colony. And I must have done that for almost more than five years. And after that, you know, uh, uh, I was asked to come here, Nasik. So. you know there was one gentleman from day one he was coming okay and 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 he came you know regularly for almost all the programs for all these years all the five years he was there and when it was announced that you know so now someone else will be taking over and you know i'll be i'll be moving to nasik like that so this gentleman he came to me and he said that prabhu ji uh i just want to tell you that uh, i want to commit uh from today onwards to chant 16 rounds and he said that he said that today after this program which means around 10 o'clock 10 pm he is going to go and start chanting 16 rounds so i said uh, wow that's wonderful and he said no i want to tell you why i said why because all these years you know there were so many who were always asking me that you know you've been coming since day one in this program you know, and we never see you chanting how many rounds do you chant and all these kind of questions and he said that you know i i was i was so put off by those questions whenever these questions these kind of questions were asked to me about my rounds number of rounds and chanting and all that and the one reason i was coming every week regularly for all these years waiting when you would also ask that question to me really okay and if you would have also asked me that question that would have been the last program i would have attended you wow <laughs> and i don't know i didn't do it consciously but somehow <laughs> i i would always meet him after the program and you know we would you know talk sometimes he would ask some questions i would talk about his family his work and you know just general discussion but somehow i remember i never asked him about his chanting that you know how many rounds do you chant and like that and on his own he said that you know i commit to chant 16 rounds so so i realize that uh, uh, you know see you can you can have someone chant whatever number of rounds hmm. by you know sometimes pushing them to chant but then you won't get quality people you you will you will always have people who will will just chant because of some obligation or some fear of you hmm. but if you really want someone you know who volunteers to chant and who is doing it you know from the heart so it's not just the chanting it's it's the entire lifestyle of a sadhaka which uh, along with the chanting you know uh, comes along so hmm. i have seen that you know it's like uh it's like holding a pigeon in your arm in your palm pigeon when you hold okay when you hold a pigeon if you hold it too tight you you might suffocate that pigeon to death and if you hold it too lightly the pigeon will fly off beautiful metaphor okay so dealing with you know uh, certain uh, people whom you are preaching to it's like you know carefully holding uh, like holding a pigeon in your in your palms hmm so you so you so that met, that metaphor itself is beautiful but in terms of practicality i think it will depend on each individual teacher's expertise and sensitivity to know now when a person is being held too tightly and when a person is being loosened 
That's I you know I was one of the first programs that I did in America in Florida. I had gone to university, and there was one boy who came for the program. He's an Indian boy settled in America, so he said that I started because of something that happened in my life. I had a near-death experience, so I started as I was spiritual search. So he mentioned mm-hmm. that uh, I've attended some programs by some Christian preachers, some Muslim mullahs, even some yoga teachers. Yeah, I felt that all of them wanted. to uh, convert me and get me to come to their path but he said that i felt that the way you were presenting you wanted to help me where you were where i am yes. so i think people are also uh, astute they they sense the pressure even if it is not overtly exerted even if it is subtle also people do sense <clears> it and if it's not there then they do feel uh, Warmth and welcoming attitude that is otherwise not so easily available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, if you look into our uh, scriptures, you know, when Arjun was receiving the knowledge from Krishna, it was it was so much uh, open that mm. you know, the chizita tha kuru. Okay, whatever uh, you have uh, heard, now it's up to you. there was no pressure at all of any kind you know and uh, uh we can see that at the same time it wasn't that krishna was not emphatic in his presentation hmm krishna was emphatic in presenting bhagavad gita but along with that krishna also gave arjun the freedom you know whether he wants to choose or whether he wants to do mm. what the he wishes you know yeah here i can do some play of words i think krishna was emphatic and empathic <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 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 understood where arjuna was but at the same time this is the path now how you want to go that's up to you but yeah so in one sense an inordinately pushy attitude not only does it put people off but it is also not representative of the mood of krishna's teachings mm. exactly yeah exactly true so over the years uh, what do you s- if you look back at the way the, uh, the community has developed over there what do you see as the parameters of success or what is it that helps you f- that makes you feel satisfied that some service was done or what basically yeah that we moved forward in the journey what are the parameters that can be used for considering that growth you know I, i this was many years ago there was uh, one i think it was brahmachari class given by his own as devamrit swami or, or some class which was which was not like a very official temple class it was a very uh, uh, closely uh, arranged for devotees kind of class okay and in that he mentioned uh very uh, simple but interesting point he said that uh in any community we need the combination of two people we need the combination the maturity of the senior devotees and the energy and enthusiasm of the new devotees who have just come <laughs> okay good way of putting it so he is a generally we find that those who have been in the movement for many years who are matured who are senior they lack the enthusiasm and the energy and those who have just come to krishna consciousness they have all the energy all the enthusiasm but they lack the maturity hmm so the perfect combination would be the combination of maturity of the seniors and the energy and enthusiasm of a new bhakta so uh, i that struck me you know quite significantly and uh, i i always try to look for this combination in order to develop uh, any community whether it is just a, a small congregation weekly program hmm. or whether it is the congregation all coming to the temple that you know having this combination that uh, maturity and the energy and enthusiasm both then only we grow hmm. we grow in in a in a healthy way hmm so 
So that's beautiful. So you could say that in the younger stages, people may have a little more zeal to convert and to try to prove that I am right and this is wrong. But the seniors will be able to nuance and balance a little bit more. Yeah, true. So to have a balance of both, you know, both kind of you know devotees in our community, it's it's very much required. That's what I think. So you are answering the parameters of success, not so much in terms of the quantity of outreach done, but in the resources available for outreach. If these are there, then the then the parameters such as say more people coming for programs or generally in our moment there have been three definitions of success: how many books distributed, how many devotees made, that means initiated or something like that, and you know how many temples built or how big a temple has been built. So you are not pro. focusing on those in one sense you are, what you are saying is that if we have the right resources and those will organically grow is that your implication yeah 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 like i remember you know i was listening to one lecture of jaydev maharaj when i was uh, in brindavan for some time this was uh, this was before uh, i joined uh, radha gopinath temple and uh, it was like i think it was uh, propas disciplines day and uh, many of propas decided to come at that time he was talking about that we should come out with a book how i think the book stories of you know so many propa disciples and now you know grand disciples of shri propa how they came to krishna consciousness and then when it was jaydev maharaj's turn he said we should also write a book how i stayed in krishna consciousness <laughs> that's true <laughs> very true sometimes i say that it's like when we write about how i came to krishna consciousness that is like a romance story or a romance movie ending with the happily ever after now we know <laughs> we know that is not going to be happily ever after there are going to be challenges of course some relationships can be much better than other but yeah, yeah we don't really focus on that much at all slowly of course i think devotee care initiatives are growing and radha gopina temple through its uh, counselor system was a pioneer in that so yeah so if, if you if you look into the history of iskon how shila prabhupad you know prabhupad he was so personal you know whoever was coming prabhupad initially was just focusing on whoever was coming to his programs he was focusing on those boys and girls who were coming and he was nurturing them he was tutoring them he was taking care of them in a such in such a personalized way and so and then they when they were felt so loved and cared so they became the resources for prabhupad you know they became you know the extended hands and legs for prabhupad so it wasn't that what i see the history of iskon it wasn't that prabhupad was initially doing extraneous efforts yes he had the vision of course he had the vision but along with that vision uh uh what uh, hands on he was doing was something just taking care of those few boys and girls who were there under him hmm you know just the other day i was speaking about uh, you know these two words one is niyat and the other is niyati really? so niyati so so niyat is that your your you know attitude mm, you could say disposition and destiny yeah your intention yeah when you have when you have you know intentions are good intentions are clean then niyati will definitely help and i was speaking the uh, i was giving the example of bhima that bhima he was so powerful and you know in his childhood he never had ill intentions of harming anyone as against uh, duryodhan who tried to poison bhima so when duryodhan tried to poison bhima who you know i i i believe this was even before they went to gurukul when duryodhan tried to poison bhima and and uh, and then when uh, duryodhan threw bhima uh, in in ganga uh, 
with a plan that okay that you know i poisoned him i finished him and uh, he's gone forever so niyati how it worked hmm. that bhima was taken to the nagaloka and bhima came out more powerful then hmm. what was expected by duryodhan so how niyat and niyati they kind of go hand in hand hmm so that's beautiful in one sense you are saying it's like a as you it's something like karma itself your work your disposition will come back to you eventually to so how are you connecting this with uh, outreach you are saying that the the yeah, so motivation with which you do outreach will be reflected eventually yeah so you you uh, you are mentioning that how sometimes you know scores they are being focused upon what is the distribution mm. score how many people come for mm. your programs and how many initiated disciples are there so on and so forth but rather than you know going for these numbers if we just have okay whoever is coming giving our everything to them and then we see that when we are sincerely try to give whatever we can for the people who are under you right now in front of mm. you then definitely you know they will become the resources or they'll get resources or somehow you know i have seen that you know numbers also they they follow numbers also follow and even if numbers don't follow sometimes you know you have more numbers and because just having more numbers you have uh, you know i remember when i was i was uh, in bangalore this was many years ago i was in bangalore and you know there was this one person who was going to the you know that other temple the big temple and mm. uh, so <laughs> he was sharing his experience that he was when he was visiting that temple he was now this might sound so funny but it is uh, so sadly true also that he was so pressurized to chant right from day 1 to chant 16 rounds hmm so he said prabhu ji uh mujhe wo bol rahe the sola mala karo sola mala karo lekin mala hi ki diya unhone <laughs> what is the, what is the meaning yeah. of that <laughs> means matlab he didn't even know what 16 rounds means he thought sola mala matlab sola mala denge mujhe alag alag sola mala god oh god okay so new that's what i'm trying to tell you he was so new and from day one he was pressurized to chant 16 rounds he didn't even know anything about mahamantra forget about 16 rounds and uh, what else so then if you if you have you know numbers in quantity but then you know then you have to deal with their problems also in the quantitative way correct and you yes. just you just waste so much of your time just cleaning up after them if you don't have quality people if you just have numbers if you just go for number then you you know practically just uh, all your energy is just sapped away in just cleaning up after them so true huh? yeah. that's a, i think that is a major issue the the kind of people we attract they are the kind of people whom who are going to whom we have to deal with eventually then we, we have to live with we have to we have to deal with so in some ways in the west we have attracted uh, uh, we are always attracted in could say non mainstream people hmm? the mainstream people would always uh, gravitate towards the mainstream religions so then that they also come with a attitude of really not accepting authority being open to more alternative ideas but also it means conspiracy theories and things like that i don't want to categorize i don't want to stereotype anyone but i'm just making mm. this point that uh, the kind of people we are going to attract those are the kind of people whom we will have to 
live with and take care of so yeah so people yeah, who like pressure I, i think there are two different problems one is people who do something because they are pressured they may stop doing that things afterwards if there is no, no one to pressure them and on another side if there is no one to tell them what to do they may not be even be able to do anything how, how do i what do i do if uh, there is no one to guide me yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it, and especially as our movement has become bigger and guidance is not so easily available in the, uh, for devotees as they go to different places and different areas it becomes mm-hmm. quite difficult yeah so you see uh, uh, i i have seen that if you two things uh, one is how adaptive you are mm. in order to in order to not just uh, practice your own krishna consciousness but present krishna consciousness and expect people to practice krishna consciousness you have to be adaptive like you know in our training there was one training wherein it was like war simulation you know uh it's it was called field craft training camp in which you have to be you know like in the jungles or or, or a war situation is created and sometimes you are thrown into you know some civilian areas civilian areas means not like crowded civilian areas but where civilians live it might be some some remote village also and you have to uh use the civilians in order to find the inroads you know towards uh the enemy oh okay so you have to be adaptive you have to somehow you know uh know the little language of those civilians and blend in with them so we were taught how to be adaptive that's what you know the point which i am trying to make you have to so uh, the, these kind of trainings which we got in which uh, you have to learn to be adaptive and the second was to improvise mm-hmm. to improve awareness improvise improvise okay to improvise mm. <laughs> i'll tell you one incident in this regard uh Uh, if you remember uh, radha gopina temple the sunday feast class the translation of the sunday feast class in hindi was happening uh, in the bhakti vedanta hall mm. you mm. you are aware of that right yes so so the system what was made was that the speaker <clears throat> uh, in the temple hall would be speaking in english of course and in the bhakti vedanta hall there is a big screen where the english speaker is seen on the screen he is muted okay and the hindi translation is there uh, which they are hearing so they are seeing the english speaker but they are hearing the english hindi translation so that was the system so the person who is translating they are not seeing the per- who is translating the person who is translating Okay. is uh, uh, is used to uh, he he would sit uh, in the dt room so from the dt room he would be seeing the speaker and he had the headphones and he would be he would be hearing the english lecture and he had a microphone and the microphone was connected all the way down to bhakti vedanta hall wherein his hindi translation would be uh, uh, transmitted over there so this was the system so what happened was now uh, the seva was given for the hindi translation of the sunday feast class to different uh, you know brahmacharis preachers so uh, it was the month i was given so which means four sundays i had to translate the english class into hindi so now now what happens is that one kind of translation is wherein the speaker stops and then you have to translate that line you know line by line translation that's easy but when the speaker is constantly speaking and you have to simultaneously speak in the same you know speed the same speed the mm. same tempo that's quite a challenge you know definitely mm. yes and especially if the speaker is like someone you know uh and from america or uh from the english speaking countries 
when you know they speak so fast sometimes so i remember this was ritu dwaj maharaj hmm? and okay. this was the first time he had come and he speaks so fast and that to a heavy you know american accent hmm. so fast and heavy american accent and i was not so much used to you know the uh, now radhanath maharaj's uh, english accent is quite understandable you know uh, even for someone who might not be you know uh, might not have studied in english, english medium still but this ritadoj maharaj is uh, you know speed and this accent was too heavy for me to translate simultaneously so i tried you know so there was the bhagavad gita shloka we should do so i was having the hindi bhagavad gita and few lines and after that i was not able to catch up with his speed so what to do <laughs> what, what i did i removed the headphones i disconnected you know the english lecture you know through the headphones which i had to listen to and uh, i closed the door of the dt room i had the verse which he had taken up and i gave my own lecture on that verse in hindi <laughs> oh god that's courageous but clever also <laughs> and what to do i see the the audience you know they 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 were all like you know at least uh, the hindi speaking audience hindi understanding audience they were at least uh, 400 500 of them you know all there sitting in bhakti vedanta hall so i just gave a lecture on that particular shloka in hindi and after that many devotees they came prabhu ji aaj ka lecture hindi ka hai na usme koi beech mein koi hai na rok hua hi nahi aapka kahin pe ruke hi nahi aap but when you took off the earphone they didn't realize you are giving your own class no 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 see the headphones was only for me to listen to the english class okay but when you took off the headphone the, your audience didn't realize you were not giving a, you were no longer hearing the class no because they didn't know na what the english speaker is speaking it was muted for them okay okay yeah, that's yeah. true so this incident happened i was feeling guilty also that you know uh, you know I, i should be i should be just uh, translating the class of maharaj but i was not able to do that so i thought at least they should get something so so i i, fe- I was feeling guilty and then i told this to radhanath maharaj that you know i did something like that and he was laughing he said really <laughs> and then he said very interesting this word he used he said that sometimes this is this is something we should not do on a regular basis but sometimes you have to improvise beautiful so the word I, so so the second point which i was making so this incident i remembered you know uh, that he mentioned that for our movement to grow we also need to improvise time to time so true yeah yeah this is a brilliant example about what can you do It, it, you can't expect maharaj to slow down you can't yeah, tell him that what can you do you have no options over there yeah Mm-hmm. That's nice. So, so here, that's where I think, uh, like Prabhupada said, time, place, circumstance. Mm. Mm-hmm. That as, as the devotees, we have to present bhakti according time, place, circumstance. So, in one sense, I'm just slightly changing the subject, but I would like to. It's related to our subject itself. You see, when Prabhupada came to India back with his Western disciples, even at that time, it was not that he attracted committed devotees. He attracted a lot of followers. In terms of people became life members, they appreciated, they supported our projects. Mm-hmm. It is mainly, I would say, from the from eighty eighty five onwards, maybe eighty seven, eighty eight onwards, actually. we started attracting quality indians whether it was in mumbai or whether it was in bengal or in delhi area delhi it became a little later i think after the when the east of kalash temple started coming but it uh-huh. does seem that uh, uh, overall those devotees who have been significantly successful in outreach in india they have they have improvised they have adopted a more of a you could say 
nuanced multi level sensitive kind of approach now of course every every preacher is individual every leader is individual but it does seem that uh, just as we consider the time place circumstance for a western audience we need to consider that in india also and india itself is very culturally diverse although there is a significant amount of similarity but still so what you said about improvising about adapting about giving people room to grow at their pace these are i think yeah. like in the early stages of our movement it was more or less 10 if you become a devotee that means you move into a temple and if you're not moving into temple then you're not actually a devotee Yeah, Ravindra Swarup was talking with him. So he yeah. told, incidentally, how congregation preaching as a concept started within ISKCON. Mm-hmm. He said earlier there was no concept of congregation. Congregation preaching means now the, I am a little hesitant to use the word preaching also because it's community development or congregation, whatever it is, congregation yeah. development. The idea is that uh, the idea that we go to a particular place and conduct a weekly program or something like that. Because in the past it was just that. Uh, if people became interested they moved into the temple and they found that indians who went to america they were not interested in moving into the temples at all they had gone to the west for for material prosperity better material prospects i don't want to just dismiss it as mundane yes life in india was is at least was quite tough and challenging especially with uh, various factors so they went there but they, they were not completely neglectful or rejecting of their culture so they wanted to have that as a part so he said that these people would come every week for our temple to our temple for programs but after talking with them for a couple of weeks we realized they're never going to move into temple so they're never going to become devotees and that's why we stopped paying much attention to them so he says it's ironic that if people had if somebody had come to the temple and asked are these people devotees are these people iskon members we would have said no but if somebody had asked them you know which religious group do you identify with they would have said iskon so they identified <laughs> with us but we didn't identify with them uh. <laughs> but over a period of time we realized that although we are paying no attention to them it was for weeks and months and years they still kept coming and of course a lot of things happened in the west i think uh, because of because of some questionable ways of doing book distribution uh we our book distribution got severely restricted we got bad pr and then when the book distribution went down then temple lost sources of finances then that then the indian community came forward to provide finances and they got a more significant role but the point was that's the time when they started thinking okay how do we cultivate these people what do we provide for these people so they are never going to move into the temple and if you're thinking that the success is moving them into temple they're never going to meet that success but what can we do for them so in in one sense it was like an accident they started the idea of okay you go to a particular place and have a weekly program mm-hmm. now weekly program is just as a normal way of cultivation right yeah. but it was not there at all at that time we see prabhupad uh, when he came even when he was building temples and life membership there was no concept of a regular program at a life member's house so this started in the mid uh, mid 80s in the west when our book distribution went out there and I, i think it must have started sometime here in india also do you mm. remember in radha gopinath where there weekly programs happening when you joined as a was it a common feature at that time or was that something no. which was just take picking up this wednesday program uh, mm. I, i like uh, took it from what bhakti rasamrit maharaj used to do the wednesday programs at uh, radha gopinath temple do you remember Yes, the Wednesday, yes. yeah. Yes. And then Gorang Prabhu. After that, Gorang Prabhu took over the Wednesday program. So, uh, in the temple, it was just uh, that one Wednesday program which uh, Bhakti Rasamrat Maharaj started. And weekly program, Radhanath Maharaj used to do the Khar program and just you know sometimes occasionally house programs, uh, you know some special occasion. Otherwise, it was only the Khar program which I remember. the friday car program which was okay. on a regular basis and then uh, after that yes of course now it was so many weekly programs they started hmm so so um, uh, uh, talking about these weekly programs and you know programs 
which uh, like kind of outreach if we use that word uh, having small pockets of congregation uh, in, in different areas in the city bombay is a big city here in nasik also we have different pockets wherein we have congregation like you know we have congregation of nasik road we have congregation you know of gangapur road you know uh, and different pockets of nasik like that so i i found that one benefit of that having programs in these different areas the benefit of that is the number of people who are attending those programs in that particular area they feel that it is their program it's like you know they they own it hmm. they 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 have a sense of ownership for that program whereas when they when they all come to the temple they have a sense of feeling that okay it's a, it's a temple program you know so everything they are just like a spectator mm. but in their area they are they are no more like a spectator in fact you know they are like you know the host who is who is inviting others and they have they they get to have a sense of responsibility that you know this i am responsible to run this program so so they they become more active so that's another benefit of uh, having you know these outreach programs uh, what i've experienced true in one sense you could say one sign of people's growth is that they are taking ownership and if the program in the temple there is very little scope for them to take ownership the program yeah. in their area they take ownership and that helps them grow also yeah like i was mentioning that when i was in radha gopinan temple everything was taken care of so i was not feeling that you know i am responsible for you know the fundraising of the temple <laughs> you know i am responsible for so many other departments like the the matchless gift store or anything but coming to nasik like you know i was feeling i am responsible for everything that you know Uh, how many kajus should we put in the butter halwa <laughs> you know i am responsible for that also even for that also we had discussion ki kaju dalne ki nahi dalne ha whether should we should we you know to save money you know for uh, something else you know so those days were also there so having the responsibility and that's how you know uh, i have seen that when you you have a challenge in front of you whatever that little challenge is there in front of you that challenge keeps you alive that challenge actually uh, makes you feel wanted that yes you can also do something for the mission so there has to be a stage for the congregation wherein they should feel that yes you know uh the mission needs me hmm. you know the sense that the mission needs me is is not uh, something which is unhealthy sometimes it might sound unhealthy oh come on i need the mission you know sometimes we 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 are under the impression that no 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 i need the mission how what the mission needs me for hmm. but to have this healthy balance that yes mission also needs you that is that sense of belonging which you know every individual should get towards the mission i hope i am not confusing that's beautiful you. i agree with you in one sense we actually there are two distinct things one is the sense of acceptance but there is also the sense of you could say ambition aspiration challenge both are required for us to stay stay you could say stay i would use the just word contented but both are required in a healthy life you can say if if we don't have something to look forward to then we can't grow but if we don't have some place where we are accepted as we are that also makes us insecure so you can say one extreme is insecurity the other extreme is is discontent or dissatisfaction or lethargy yeah. so yeah that's true so in one like, of this you know, sorry yeah these two things like 
uh, i need the mission and the mission needs me okay so i understand that when you are <clears throat> both both feelings should be there mm. both of these perspectives should be there so when i say i need the mission so that should bring about my humility okay okay and when uh, i say the mission needs me that should bring about my gratitude that the mission is finding me of some significance that the mission is saying that yes the mission needs me so that should bring about not egoistic attitude but gratitude beautiful okay towards that yeah it's not in a then it's healthy, then it's healthy. that's true it's uh, i think prabhupada also mentions this in the 10th canto purport that that or is it in lila amrut it is said that that when prabhupada was worrying about whether the juhu temple would uh, when, when there was this whole conspiracy to try to take the juhu temple land away from us so i think uh, there is mention that prabhupada wrote at that time the 10th canto purport and he says that just as yashoda always worried about krishna whether he would be protected whether he would be nourished or not so similarly the pure devotees of krishna worry about krishna's deity and krishna's temple <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's actually there it is uh, it's uh, it's when that is there it's not in a yashoda doesn't think that it, there is no arrogance over there in that oh krishna needs me that's actually a sense of love connectedness and i would say gratitude also because as you said in one sense there is there is something which we can also do there is something for me to do over here that i yeah. can also make my contribution here yeah so in one sense to be able to for for devotees to get this feeling again i think we will need a a multi level definition of success because if uh, if the definition of success are you know how many people have you made into devotees or how many books you have distributed uh, or how much funds you have raised how much temple you have built then not everybody can be very good at that and then they may feel devalued and they may feel what am i what what can i do over here so in one sense both for attracting new people as well as sustaining existing people we need a you could say multiple definitions of success in our movement yeah 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 in fact uh, you know any organization you see uh, you will find that uh, the the different levels in which uh, the the members of that organization they are contributing for the overall success of that organization is is something which uh, you cannot uh, sometimes they are irre- irre- irreplaceable you cannot replace them with anyone else you know like uh, you know uh, if if there is someone who is uh, say say a, a cricket match a cricket team in a cricket team so you can't have just you know uh, uh, excellent batsmen all level players are excellent batsmen you can't have you know all level players are excellent bowlers you know or you can't have all level players are excellent fielders or wicket keepers you know you have to have a good wicket keeper you have to have good bowlers you have to have good batsmen and all the combination of these makes the team win a match Mm. and nobody is looked down upon you know the the tail end batsmen you know they might be good bowlers but you know sometimes the tail end batsmen you know just one or two runs here and there which they make sometimes it makes the team win so uh, i i believe that uh, it's it's a team effort you know we are talking of sankirtan we are talking of team effort wherein everyone uh, uh, pitches in everyone pitches in their their contribution and you know in krishna's eyes it's always you know as valuable as uh, 
you know the story of the squirrel and hanuman ji hmm <laughs> that's so true you know you given both a contemporary example of cricket and an example in from our tradition so so overall maybe maybe i'll ask one or two questions because i don't want to take too much of your time maybe we can continue the discussion in future also sometimes but uh, say i when i whenever i have visited nasik i have also seen you providing forums in on ram navmi or other times for say groups who are teaching say maybe bharatanatyam or teaching some kind of traditional indian uh, dance forms or culture forms to come and give a pre- to present their performance over there so in some i i i don't know whether i have seen this i don't think i have seen this in many other temples and uh, of course sometimes devotees may themselves if some some devotee kids or some some congregation members are skilled in this they they do it uh, they perform some dramas and they do some other dance performance something like that but this was engaging and those who are not yet devotees or not, not devotees you could say at least in our sense conception of the word devotees so what inspired mm-hmm. you to do that and how do you see the uh, how does that contribute to the the overall shaping of the community's perception in the broader society uh i found that uh, you know first of all any group who is favorable and uh, who who wants to uh serve the mission in 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 any small way whether it is through a dance performance or whether it is just coming and playing some instrument in the kirtan again the same principle that they feel so wanted that yeah you know they were they were being recognized and when the existing congregation sees that that okay you know here is a group and uh, they have been given this opportunity to perform for the pleasure of uh, you know the deities for the pleasure of the devotees when they see that then they also feel that you know there is there is scope for everyone you know here in we prove the statement of shila prabhupad or for shila prabhupad when the statement is made that he built a house in which the whole world could live so uh, you know to get this feeling to the congregation existing devotees that you know they can bring you know people like these people who have you know uh, some vibhuti of krishna in them you know and uh, and and that's how from from that whatever you know uh, whatever little glamour they have which is just uh, you know uh, what krishna mentions that it is it is his ansha and they can connect with krishna through that so so the existing congregation feels that yes you know we can get whoever our contacts also to krishna consciousness like this so it gives them a boost also it gives them uh, a a new way of opens up a window for them to to get more and more people in the fold of krishna consciousness and i have seen that many of them even though for years they may not be like typical 10 kind of devotee were in their chanting 16 rounds under a counselor or becoming initiated but they are such beautiful hearted people and even though they may not become quote and quote that kind of a typical devotee which we expect but they bring so many others oh i got an opportunity over here please come let's see and then you may you may see that you know this person who might just be an instrument to bring so many others who might become serious you know if we really are looking for that kind of serious devotees then yes you know and then uh, who knows that uh, in the eyes of krishna who is a serious devotee and who is not you know who am who, who am i i am i am to judge whether you know he is a serious devotee or he is not a serious devotee 
sometimes you know they might be practicing whatever uh, you know in so many lifetimes and uh, uh, this might be you know krishna's way of bringing them now i really appreciate this vision that they already have some vibhuti of krishna and uh, you know when i had met mahara his holiness radhanath maharaj in chicago he also men- uh, in uh, yeah he mentioned one point to me he talked about how allen ginsberg and george harrison never became committed devotees but prabhupada encouraged them and they both of them brought so many people before george harrison allen ginsberg was the biggest uh, you could say vip because of whom a lot of people came to the krishna conscious movement and actually i have been reading a little bit about the counter culture he was one of the pioneers of the counter culture actually he was quite influential so ma- what yeah. maharaj told me is that and there are some people for whom we open the doors so that they can come to krishna and there are some people who open the doors for us to take krishna to others <laughs> wow <laughs> now if those people we try to pull toward krishna they are not going to come but they will close the doors also so those yeah. people we may have to accept at their level but they can open doors for us so yeah. uh, what do you said that yeah. because of them many other people also start coming that's so true mm. yeah and uh, so yeah like like one maharaj i think george harrison's that uh, memorial class maharaj was mentioning that you know once uh, in in uh, in a group this question was asked that how many of you your first contact with krishna consciousness was through that song my sweet lord of george harrison Hmm. And eighty percent of the people in the audience, they raised their hands. They said that yes, that was their first contact. Hmm. That's so true. So he opened the doors for so many people, and also just one more point to reflect on what you are saying, that you know we don't know what that our definition of devotion doesn't necessarily reflect the. actual devotional status of any particular soul you don't know where they are so overall uh, how do you see this in the light of prabhupada sometimes saying that we should always see like performances done by devotees like prabhupada wanted uh, dramas to be done by devotees he wanted in btg articles to be written by devotees he wanted uh, i was recently talking with one devotee who was it Say Prabhupada wanted movies to be made, but he said all the all the actors in the movie should be devotees. Mm-hmm. Now probably we'll need a very big movement to be able to have um, that level of caliber as well as uh, that level of uh, 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 that that level of caliber and that that level of say to have artists of that caliber to be devotees. But how do you see those statements overall? See. Uh... there are two things here over here first is that when we are presenting krishna consciousness and uh, it's it's something which is uh, you know we are uh, directly representing our guru parampara and then we present the entire package of krishna consciousness Hmm. so one is our presentation and the other is engagement of the other people into krishna consciousness so when i how i understand what prabhupad mentioned was that you know that uh, devotee should be there to perform the dramas so when it is presented from our side it should be like that but when there is someone who uh, is having that particular uh, say for example uh, there is there is an entire uh, team and and they 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 perform these drama shows you know so that can be like not something which is uh, uh, which is our mainstream presentation for the audience but it is presented in such a way that we are engaging them hmm. in a cultural activity which is organized by iskon oh so it's one sense 
it's very clear that they are not our spokes people they are they are not representing us so they are not representing okay that's a good point yeah so this is also very important that we have to we can't absolutize prabhupad's uh, statements we have to see in what context he has spoken them and then apply greatly yeah okay. so yeah okay. so maybe one one last question how do you deal with say people who already have some religious affiliations say if they are worshiping particular devtas or they are already belonging to some organizations and uh, they are open to coming to our programs but still they are already having those uh, affiliations so how do you deal with is that a major obstacle you feel no and how do you deal with it first of all you know thanks to kaliyuga we don't find uh, people so much committed to so many people you know actually committed to one particular devata or one particular path you know uh, in, in a rigid way uh, but even if there are people uh, definitely uh, i i have so many um, who are like good friends with me and forget about our you know bona fide vaishnav sampradayas but they are from Say some are Jains and you know uh, some are from some other paths, but uh, you know they 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 see that uh, this person like say you know they get connected to me because of being vegetarian. That's it. You know that this person oh, is okay. vegetarian. Okay. Okay, and they are also vegetarian, or uh, you know this person uh, he is into chanting. a mantra and they are also chanting into some mantras you know like that so uh, i always uh, look into what is that one common denominator which will connect mm. one common factor which will connect and just keep that as you know a friendship for sometimes many years and sometimes what happens is that they also uh, seeing that uh, this person's krishna presented in a very uh, holistic way they you know they start appreciating krishna consciousness they may not follow krishna consciousness like how we follow but they start appreciating krishna consciousness which according to me is also krishna consciousness krishna consciousness at multiple levels i agree and people can appreciate at different levels entirely true so again if if we have that 10 level conception of krishna consciousness that's where the problem comes up and you can see also prabhupada did that isn't it with respect to the life members who joined prabhupada never pushed them to become initiated or move into the temple at all prabhupada appreciated what they were doing yeah. and many of them did have their own past cultural affiliations so that doesn't i don't think that matters so much so so true it's true. like you know when tamal krishna maharaj you know uh when uh, he departed and after that uh, myself govind prabhu we were we were uh, we were in america we met uh, tamal krishna maharaj's brother and tamal oh. krishna maharaj's brother i remember uh he is also practicing devotee i don't know whether he is initiated now but there was a point yeah, where his name is krishna krupa and he is initiated by giriraj maharaj recently yeah, so he had he had approached tamal krishna maharaj for initiation first oh okay and tamal krishna maharaj said that i have hundreds of disciples but i have only one brother <laughs> oh god <laughs> so I, i loved that you know that uh, a uh, reply given by tamal krishna maharaj that i have hundreds of disciples but i only one brother so let me have my brother <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful <laughs> amazing so so what you are saying over here is that different relationships have their flavors and we yeah. have to preserve them we don't have to homogenize Yes, all yes. relationships in terms of say practicing in terms of preaching or getting people to practice bhakti yeah yeah beautiful exactly exactly
exactly and i think that that diversity or inclusivity is what is uh, what is very much uh, required in today's world because as you said there earlier that because of kaliyuga it's not so easy for people to commit to any path not just to their whatever they were practicing in their family or their dynasty earlier or their overall social circle but even when they come to krishna consciousness it's not easy to uh, mm-hmm. to take a high level of commitment but that doesn't mean we have to we have no place for them so giving us place for them really makes it uh, makes it makes them them also get connected at some level and it also helps us to also know that our outreach is growing in different ways so are there maybe one last question here so are there any ways in which or any occasions when you see the whole community not just necessarily the committed 16 rounder but the whole community coming together for the for the service of the dts or for some cause like say maybe when you had some uh, you have some major festivals or some major occasions when you are expanding the project or something like that so or that that you are that you are a part of a big community and there is such a supportive community i think you know we as a movement recognize the need for having bridges when our bhaktivedanta manor was threatened in london and then if we had portrayed ourselves simply as one religious group then we wouldn't have been able to save the manor but it was because it was presented as the biggest hindu temple in london in england at that time so that's mm-hmm. why we got a broader community to support us now probably we didn't have had anything that dramatic but are there any occasions when this whole large community with different people practicing at different levels comes together in a unified way well nothing uh, that major which has happened ever here in nasik that we we had to approach them or we required their help you know to save our temple save our congregation nothing like that so significant nothing so major but because like you know we have very good terms with rss and uh, you know uh, even art of living you know uh, so uh, we have you know a good rapport with them and enough investment we have done that whenever if required god forbid whatever time comes if if required then we know that uh, definitely they'll uh, they'll reach out and uh, they'll definitely be very supportive very helpful in in uh, in in the need of the art hmm and will that go the other way also if they need yes. us we will also be there yes 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 yeah. yes we do you know, that i remember when i was in london i think you also spent a good amount of time in uk in your outreach yeah in that london i think we have integrated with the broader community quite well broader you could say hindu community so i was talking with uh, shri dharma prabhu and some of the other leaders there they mentioned this point that we we know when to focus on the philosophical and when to focus on the cultural so philosophically yeah. we and other organizations may be different but culturally we have similarities and we when we focus on those we can have we can have friends so it seems that when i think swami pramukh had passed away so our devotees uh-huh. had also gone for their for their like memorial service and then in the um, manner newsletter also they had published a condolence kind of message like a news uh, news in the news section that a con- condolence meet was held and devotees participated in it something like that not condolence it was a memorial mm-hmm. so i think that appreciating that we can't just reduce people to their religious affiliations or even a religious organization or a group to its ideology because they the group is also just as people are multifaceted even the groups are multifaceted and there are many things common among us which we can actually uh, which we, which can be utilized for mutual benefit that also requires a breadth of vision so was this something you just naturally had because you had devotional upbringing or was it something which happened by your experiences radha gopinath this breadth of vision well one thing i can say that you know uh, if you are part of 
the central security force like air force wherein okay. you, have, you know it's not your choice but you have an exposure with practically every state of the country you know every culture so i was you know living amongst you know the hardcore south indians with uh, you know north indians and bengalis and you know uh, the east indians you know all of them so so once you are you know uh, you are kind of living day in and day out with all kinds of people with all cultural backgrounds you have to you have to be so open minded you know that people the language they speak the way they eat the way they walk the way they live the way they do everything is sometimes so diverse so that uh, i can say that to some extent that helped me when i when i joined that uh, you know uh, seeing all the diversity and accepting the diversity in fact uh, uh, being in the armed forces we are taught that you know all of this diversity finally it boils down to you know your patriotism for the country you know hmm. and, and if you translate that that all these diversities it boils down to you know pleasing krishna so they they might be doing in their own way or you know uh, we can we can just help them give some agyat sukruti by by connecting them maybe in a remote way with you know the pure process of krishna consciousness but finally it all boils down to you know bringing them to krishna somehow or the other hmm so beautiful so, you know recently i have also been introspecting how our past shapes our practice of krishna bhakti our priorities in krishna bhakti our vision of krishna bhakti so sometimes we see the past as especially if we have had some misconceptions or some unhealthy habits it's just like a burden to be shed but it's not that only that there is also some moral and cultural capital in that which is which shapes us without even our knowledge so appreciating that it it does radically change how we practice and how we share so i think your example of being in the armed forces makes a it makes eminent sense in that context Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. So, it has been wonderful discussing. You know, maybe sometimes we could discuss about uh, since you have experience in battle and sports both, we can talk about how battle and sports metaphors can be used in practice against sharing bhakti. That will be. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That will be fun. <laughs> That will be fun. We'll plan that out. So, yeah, sure. should I try to summarize what we discussed? You would like to add something right now yeah. toward the end, or should? Yes. yes. please please go ahead mm. okay so it is today we discussed about say how you help develop a inclusive spiritual community in nasik we started with your experiences quite remarkable to have a grandfather who was a kathakar and then to have a picture of krishna seen in the picture that you are attracted to perceiving that picture and then finding radha gopna temple in a week or so after that and then so while you had the cultural orientation but what you found attractive was also the logical presentation that yeah. attracted and then also that interaction that if if a non indian american person is saying this is your geeta is your book so that inspired to share with to study it and share it with others and um, with respect to nasik the the sacred place itself is more like a background but because that is not the defining identity so that didn't really affect so much the specific vision for outreach that you had so we discuss about the outreach i think three four different things first is with respect to <clears throat> expanding or growing you focused on first connecting with the people there understanding them and giving accessible channels through kathas and other things to come to people so prabhupad's point about understanding presenting our time place circumstances it was about language it was about 
a good example of improvisation that <laughs> what is required in terms of uh, translate we translating can't be done you give your own class because that ultimately you have to serve the people so being adaptive and improvising so you also mentioned that this devotee this gentleman but i also like this word, word that you use you know not non devotee or person the gentleman so what he said is that he started he said i will start chanting because nobody pushed me for chanting for so many years and even you didn't do that so yeah. so actually accepting people where they are at while providing them a pathway but not pushing them too much so it's like the bird you said beautiful example that you hold a pigeon if you hold it too tightly it will get squeezed will get crushed but if you hold it too loosely it will just uh, it will just fly away so we need to if you have to train it or help it so we need a balance of both and then another point of hierarchy what are the words you said durachar uh ach durachar and not anachar what was that lachar lachar uh, okay durachar lachar achar then vichar and prachar or vichar achar vichar achar and prachar was it five ownership so no krishna trust krishna follow krishna mm. yeah it's interesting i would say if you are doing western outreach you will need something below that is believe in krishna i think that is not a major challenge in india for us although there are atheistic people but i think uh-huh. there are so many theistic people so that is not a major stumbling stumbling block in our outreach yeah 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 and then we also talked about <clears throat> when we when we are presenting bhakti so we are actually like you talked about inclu- giving facility for people from other culture from other cultural forums to come and present so it is we are encouraging them and even if they don't become devotees they become appreciative and they may get more and more people to also come for the programs and uh, in general we can't real they they have some vibhuti of krishna so let us use it let give this give them a forum for using in krishna service and we can't really know what is their devotional status so that's between them and krishna and before that you also mentioned that well while we are while we are sharing krishna bhakti it's uh, important for us to <clears throat> understand where our audience is at and how we can take them forward so with respect to that <clears throat> you later had mentioned that how with other organizations also you have had enough capital invested so that if if the need is there they can help and working in the indian national forces help you in that direction uh, to uh, to see beyond the diversity the differences to the shared purpose the shared purpose of, of <clears throat> we are all trying to you could say protect dharma or pro- help people come closer to krishna and overall Uh, you may rather when i asked you about the definitions of success what you focused on was not the external parameters but rather on the internal resources we are having younger devotees who have a lot of energy and older devotees who have a lot of maturity if both are there then they can be balanced if we focus only on on the quantitative aspects of success then that can lead to that can lead to a very utilitarian kind of mentality what are the example you gave for that a striking example that mention some story or some anecdote that uh, we become very utilitarian mm. story now what, some anecdote some story some example Incident? you gave of how are how are niyati and uh, niti niyat oh bhima bhima's example yeah niyat yeah niyat niyat and niyati niyat and niyati yeah bhima's example hmm. yeah so ultimately our motivation will will shape how things emerge how things come out yes uh, and also contemporary example so yeah we discuss also about prabhupad exam prabhupad when he said that we, we should give the full presentation of krishna consciousness but we don't demand that everybody has to adopt it fully 
we can let them adopt at their level so in our in if it's a program in our temple people have the facility for the full presentation yes so any concluding words you want to add prabhu oh, i think you are you are a living shruti dar <laughs> oh my god short term shruti dar <laughs> for a, for an hour or two after the talk but it's wonderful so impressed so, thank you thank you so much for showering so much love and affection all these years in fact you are the original nasik wala <laughs> i don't know about original but i learned about nasik or i started appreciating the spirituality of nasik after i became a devotee yeah, otherwise i was just <laughs> living in nasik that just a, accidentally i happened to be there mm-hmm. yeah. but wonderful ru thank you so much for your thank association you. and your inspiration thank you so much for having me we'll probably ha- have some other podcast in future again sometime yes. we'll have we'll have surely surely thank you hare krishna thank you hare krishna hare krishna yeah.